the bridge to possible. Good day, everyone. I'm Zach Taylor, Director of Strategic Communications for Cisco's Contact Center Business Unit. Thank you for joining our webinar today on WebEx Contact Center Enterprise. We've got a star-studded lineup today to accomplish our goal of informing you about what's happening in the enterprise contact center space. Joining me today are Sheila McGee-Smith, uh, a renowned contact center analyst, and Omar Tawakal, our GM and VP of our business unit. Sheila, a little bit about yourself, even though you don't need an introduction most of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Good to be here with you, Omar. Yeah. Um, Sheila McGee-Smith. I am the President and Principal Analyst of McGee-Smith Analytics. I have been an industry analyst concentrating on the contact center market full-time since 1990. My very first report in 1990 was ACDs in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been quite a journey. And you're the chair of the Enterprise Connect Contact Center uh, group. Track, that, yeah, exactly. And you've done a lot to really forward our industry in the last number of years, so thank you for that. Omar, introduce yourself. Thank you. Pleased to be here. I'm the VP and GM of the Cisco Contact Center. I started in this business a few months ago when Cisco acquired Voicea, the company I was the CEO of and ran, and we built an enterprise voice assistant. Before that, <clears throat> excuse me, I ran the Oracle Data Cloud, uh, which essentially supplied data into the marketing industry, uh, which was formed after they acquired my company, Blue Kai. Mm -hmm. Really excited to be here, and uh, we've got uh, quite a good amount of stuff to discuss today. So significant cloud and AI background, more or less, I would say. Absolutely. That was pretty much my entire career. There you go. Well, we could just say we're done now, because that's no. Just <laughs> So, okay, so folks, why are we here today? Let's talk about outcomes. We're gonna first talk about outcomes because you've invested your time with us and we want you to know exactly what we're trying to accomplish and we'll loop back at the end to say, have we been successful? First of all, it's probably never been a more interesting time in the contact center space. There's several trends, confluence of things that are occurring that we are right in the midst of and, and we're gonna ask Sheila to step us through what those are. A very interesting time. The other thing is that Cisco is in the midst of helping our customers in their cloud contact center transition. Exactly what are we doing and most importantly, why are we doing it? and you'll find out some really interesting information there. We're also going to introduce to you a new solution called WebEx Contact Center Enterprise, what I call a customer in solution that we have uh, just announced and will be in, in market with on a global basis here. And then for, finally, of course, uh, no webinar would be useful unless we gave you some practical insights and some actions to take. We're here to inform, but we're also here to help you have some action. So with that being said, with that kind of setup, Sheila, we all know, uh, us that love this industry, that there's somewhere between 17 and 20 million contact center agents one way or the other in the world who wake up every day and log in, put a headset on, and serve customers. And right now, the estimates are somewhere between 15 and 20% of those have gone cloud. So the question is, why not more? And uh, by the way, contact center is kind of the last big enterprise application to go cloud, right? Email, CRM, ERP, and all of a sudden, we're in the midst of this contact center kind of transition. So give us your thoughts there on why the transition is not as far along as it could be. So uh, I think we could really break it down to small to medium business mm -hmm. started moving to the contact center cloud about five years ago. We started seeing real adoption. And for that size of company, yeah. it was easy to just do a flash cut, mm -hmm. to take 20, 30, 50 agents and just completely replace yeah. premises-based solutions. But if you look at larger contact centers, and so large is now thinking about 500 agents to 1,000 agents, and then of course, I believe super mm -hmm. extra large mm -hmm. contact centers with tens of thousands of agents. That kind of decision was much more difficult. Why? It was very costly, mm -hmm. right? And companies didn't have the stomach mm -hmm. or the budget to replace the existing systems. And one of the reasons they didn't have the, the stomach for it was that the existing systems 
were very highly customized, mm -hmm. right? Integrated not only into other enterprise applications, but also into custom software. Mm -hmm. There's a, a surprising amount of custom CRM, for example, mm -hmm. right? Uh, customer relationship management systems that are not one of the big names like Oracle or, or, or Salesforce that we know. And reintegrating the contact center to those was just seen as a bridge too far, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. um, and then IT departments are swamped with projects, many of them to bring their companies into the cloud. There's a great uh, quote from Andy Jassy during his uh, keynote at um, reInvent this year mm -hmm. in Vegas in November. And he said, companies have two choices. You're either born in the cloud or you need to be reborn in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And so while the contact center is important, some of those companies are focused, laser focused on trying to transform their businesses. Yeah, I just, uh, your stat kind of caught my attention. I've heard it up to 50% of companies have custom desktops, right? Mm -hmm. And we know contact center agents not always go to one desktop. So, so great information. So tell us, you know, today we are in that on-premise ACD market that's been around. Uh, it started, I know, in 1974, with that first Rockwell there at, at Continental Airlines. And uh, to a great extent, there are many out there. But what is the kind of the schism between why these solutions aren't delivering uh, potentially in this notion of where we're going in the marketplace. So as much as there, as there are those issues that we just talked about, about companies not wanting to move, yeah. they're feeling the pressure, and the pressure has just been building over the last three or four years, right? They're not able to deliver digital channels in an integrated way. Sure, there's lots of silos of digital applications, yeah. you know, serving customers, but they're not integrated with the voice. Yeah. The integration to CRM and other systems of record, again, is not as tight in a cloud world as it can be as it was in the premises mm -hmm. world, if you've got a premises ACD. So think about having a cloud-based CRM, and 80% of CRM seats are in the cloud, mm -hmm. right? And so you've got this premises ACD, it's like connecting a dinosaur Right? To a soaring unicorn, right? <laughs> you know? Um, so, you know, so we don't have the, the same, le they're not delivering what they need to deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, from a reporting and journey analytics perspective, premises ACDs cannot support a mobile workforce. Mm -hmm. There are ways of doing it, but they're so clunky and expensive, mm -hmm. just like we've seen with work at home agents. You know, you and I have been in this market for a while. Mm -hmm. For 20 years, companies have said they had work at home solutions. Mm -hmm. The cloud has completely done that level of enablement that was required to yeah. really make it so that agents could work from home. And then finally, I mean, it all comes down to that final bullet point I have there, which is the agility to make changes as needed. You get a new competitor. You have to do something quickly. You have a born-in-the-cloud competitor. You have to be able to be more agile. Yeah. And so the pressure is really on. Yeah, I've, I, we, we hear that often from executives. Uh, regardless of the cost profile of Cloud Contact Center, it's about the agility. So tell us a little bit about uh, some of the work you've done with, uh, in looking at the market in terms of transition and some, some facts and data out there, yeah. right? So this is fantastic data from uh, Dimension Data. Mm -hmm. For the last 20 years, they've been doing a benchmarking report. They call it the Contact Center Benchmarking Report. And they look at trends. And the great thing about it is over time. So what, how have things been changing over time? And so in 2019, in the last report that they published, they talked about you know, what portion of the market has already moved to cloud infrastructure, and then what portion is planning to do so in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. So as an ex-psychologist, before I was a business person, um, we know that, that explains this, it. <laughs> <laughs> we know that people of, often intend to do things that they don't do as quickly as they hope to, mm -hmm. but I think this data points to some great trends mm -hmm. about, number one, the intention to move. Yeah. Whether they get there as quickly as they think they will, is a different story. But then the other thing that's point highlighted by the various options here mm -hmm. that Dimension Data gave to respondents is there are several different ways to deploy cloud, yeah. right? We can deploy cloud in a private cloud, in our own data centers. We can use the public cloud, right? And we can have some hybrid between those. Mm -hmm. And so there's different levels of appetite yeah. from enterprise companies in terms of how they want to move to the cloud. Right. Um, the other thing that I should say about this data is it is skewed toward the upper end of the marketplace, mm -hmm. right? So if this was 
a, a study that included both small and large, mm -hmm. we'd probably see more public cloud, yeah. right? But this, you know, Dimension Data is a big systems integrator globally, and so the people who respond yeah. to their survey tend to be the higher end. So, and that's who we're talking to a lot today, so that's okay. This yeah. data matches that. So what's shocking about that is if you look at the 6% for cloud shared or public infrastructure, yeah, that definitely speaks to the, the, the larger uh, corporations. Yeah. Right, who are not ready to make that kind of choice, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, so. it, it is interesting, and we see that dynamic when we talk to customers. Every conversation talks about some element of cloud. The question is how, why, and when, really the three big questions. So let's dig into a couple of three trends that are associated with what's going on that are shaping today's contact centers. You and I have been through many eras of trends, and uh, sometimes we talk about there's old history happening to new people, but there is new history happening to new people these days. And the first is this notion of experience management. Uh, there was a book written in 1995 by Michael Tracy called The Discipline of Market Leaders. I always remember this. Oh, he yeah. said there's three ways you can differentiate a company. You can make the best product, you can have the lowest price, or you can have the best differentiated experience. And at that time, he used the best product example of Apple. Lowest price was Walmart and their, and their, their supply chain. And then the best experience, he used Nordstrom's at the mm -hmm. time. And his suggestion was that over time, price and product would be normalized because of supply and demand but experience would become that long-term differentiator. And I think we're seeing that play out here. So talk to us a little bit about experience management and basically how does the call center play a role in that these days? So it's interesting, if you asked most CXO, mm -hmm. they would have this vision of their own business, mm -hmm. you know, be it the CIO or the CEO, that they have the contact center and there's all these other components that are around it. Uh, that marketing and sales and all the channels that co uh, consumers want to use. And it's all just a beautiful picture, right? That everything is connected and it's just a seamless world. But the reality is mm -hmm. that, <laughs> especially in a premises-based world, mm -hmm. is we have you know, one hardware-based system with connections to some of the other systems, mm -hmm. but not all of the other systems, and things being replaced or, or brand new components being brought in that can't get connected to the old. So the reality here is we can't deliver the seamless ex experience yeah. that CXOs know that consumers are looking for when that's the reality of the back end that we have. And what's interesting about that picture is I see waves of innovation that you and I have experienced mm -hmm. over the years. We had the self-service wave. We had the multi-channel, omni-channel wave. We had the workforce optimization wave. And every one of those created a new set of arrows and that are up there representing what's on the right. So that being said, what, are, what is the role of the contact center in terms of customer journey? Is it the place? Is it a place or the place? Is it, tell us how you see that. So as we sit here in 2020, what we know is that it is never the starting place. In fact, over the last few days, you and I have had meetings, and one of the comments that was so apt, right, is that when somebody ends up in the contact center, it's because something went wrong somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The product didn't work, the product didn't get delivered, the service wasn't performed well, and so, you know, in this photo, you've got the contact center with a target on its back, and there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. Because by the time somebody gets there, they've already tried something else. Yeah. They've al Not only has something failed, mm -hmm. but they have tried, perhaps, to self-serve. They've right. tried to go into their mobile app. They've tried to go to the website. Yeah. And so by the time they get there, they're not in the best space, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we're going to talk about it perhaps a little bit later, but they're looking for an agent who is all-knowing mm -hmm. and, and different from even 10 years ago. Yeah. 10 years ago, you went to an agent and you didn't have this expectation that they knew everything about your situation. Yeah. But now, I know that I have an account number, that I've given you access to that, that I've given you permission. And so when I give you that permission to have my information, I expect you to use it to serve me. Yeah. And why do we expect that? Because of the very best companies do that. Yes. Right? Yeah. We all have the Amazon experience. Mm. We all have the Apple experience. And we know that we now expect every company to rise to that level of experience. Mm -hmm. So customer journeys are not starting or ending in the contact center anymore. And so we have to have a better way of doing experience management mm. and having those agents have access to the information and to the events yeah. that have are both before and after. 
Yeah, I use a metaphor when I travel overseas. I call the contact center the digital goalkeeper. Essentially, it's the last thing between you and the goal. When the goal could be, you you stop you know attrition with with the customer or you solve a problem. And so uh, that is that is we live in this world of exception. So, uh, Omar. You know, we have some very, very uh, specific thoughts about this in terms of what we're delivering in the marketplace and some of the things you're leading us on. Share with what you're seeing in there. Yeah, I mean, the core issue here, as Sheila was saying, is consumers, by the time they show up at the contact center, they've had an extensive journey with your product or with your service before. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, when they leave the contact center, they will continue to have an experience with you. And so if you can change the way this is delivered, so that both the agents and the supervisors in the contact center see the journey before and after. And in the context of their conversation with the consumer, they can realize, oh, this was a consumer who was stranded in an airport in Denver, there was bad weather, uh, now they're having another issue, I'm gonna treat them extra special. Mm -hmm. If they had that context, and they even knew perhaps some survey that the consumer had responded to or some tweet, when they were conversing with them, they can take that context into account, they acknowledge it, they can defuse the situation, they can make that customer happy. So the, the first aspect of really understanding the full customer journey is to provide the context to the agent in real time while they're conversing so they can have a much better experience. That's number one. Number two, though, is for the executives who run the company. As Sheila was saying, things that happen in the contact center provide feedback around something you should improve in the website, something mm -hmm. you should improve in the product experience, something you should improve in the design of how you have your contact center. So some leading contact centers we've spoken to have said, we want to eliminate whole time at all. We just want to have every call go directly to a real human agent. Mm -hmm. To them, that's what they thought would impact the experience. There are so many aspects of designing an experience. Instead of leaving it up to the, uh, to, the, to the executives to just decide based on intuition, what you need is data. You yeah. need the data to tell them what's gonna move the needle on in the experience and let them do what if analysis. Um, so if we could um, uh, move on, we acquired a company called CloudCherry, mm -hmm. uh, essentially in October, really excited about what they did. And what they would do is give journey analytics. They would go in and fully map the journeys that the consumers were having with that enterprise, and then provide deep analytics that lets you go down to the individual consumer level as you're analyzing those experiences and understanding what's broken with those journeys, what needs to be improved. They're pulling in data from 17 different channels. They're allowing you to do all sorts of listening posts and surveys across all the different channels, and then allowing you to dive deep into an analysis of what needs to change, what change trends. You're sometimes in a contact center, something is emerging, something's going wrong somewhere, and with minutes or hours, you see these trends kind of jump up in the analytics, and you as a team are able to jump on it, take action, and turn something around that in normal circumstances could have been um, essentially terrible for your brand, but if right. you get ahead of it, because you're informed, you can do something with it. So one of the things we've noticed with CloudCherry is we've integrated it into the contact center solution. It's now available in our product. Very quickly, by the way. Record right. time, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so the, the team's quite uh, excited about it. I actually went out and visited the team after we acquired them. Great culture. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were able to deliver fast, but we also allow we essentially sell this as a standalone mm -hmm. because in quite a few situations, people are just going to want to map these journeys outside the contact center, even if they don't have a Cisco contact center solution. Mm -hmm. right. So we sell it both ways. Right. So did not like over a hundred companies were already using Cloud Cherry. Huge companies, some yes. some quite huge, some smaller. And so you know that there's an appetite for the solution even on its own. Correct. Uh, yeah. And kind of referring to what Sheila was talking about, there are situations where we go in talking to the contact center execs and they pull in that team, introduce them to their CEO, to the rest of the company, because they understand this is job one. Yeah. Actually, if you look at the trends, you'll find that some CEOs have things like NPS in their compensation. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they're paying attention. Absolutely. Yeah, and what's good, and we'll learn later on, is that this, even though it says Cloud Cherry, all of our customers, whether premises or cloud, will be able to take advantage of this capability, which is a real stalwart of what we're doing and what we're all about. Well, the second thing is this notion of integrated collaboration. You know, I remember a couple years ago, my daughter got married, and we were in this store looking at wedding dresses. And the store was like 100 feet by 80 feet, right? An 800 square foot store. And in the corner was this little booth with two people in it called customer service. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. 
I said, isn't this whole floor customer service? Why do I have to walk over there? And is the other 760 feet not customer service? <laughs> and so we've been talking about this for years, that someday the whole business is a contact center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very forward-looking discussion. And I think that we're beginning to see the vestiges of this in the marketplace in terms of integrated collaboration and, and team collaboration uh, bringing uh, new solutions to the marketplace and how we serve customers. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are some of the barriers that we see to enterprise customer experience that integrated collaboration may solve, Sheila? So before we talked about the fact that the systems today, based in premises, can't tie into mm -hmm. the other departments. And so that carries over in terms of delivering an experience. Businesses continue to operate with very siloed departments. Mm -hmm. So what are the big trends in the market? In fact, we have a session on it at Enterprise Connect is about the assimilation of marketing and sales and service, mm -hmm. right? In this digital world, suddenly marketing and sales are so much part of the journey, much more than in the past. We don't walk into stores, but we leave a footprint of what we want to do or buy all over, the, all over the web. And so to the extent that companies can gather that and help serve customers better because of it, mm -hmm. right, then we have a better experience for the consumer. But if the contact center solution is its own silo, then how does the agent get that information? How do, you know, I, I've used this example for, for, for years about Amazon. You know, if I'm an Amazon customer who spends $500 a year on Amazon, right, um, that's fine. But what if that Amazon agent knew that I was just looking at a $6,000 ring, right? Should I get a different experience? Should they know more and better what I want and what I need? Mm -hmm. um, they should. Mm -hmm. They should suddenly perk up. I should not have any hold time, to your point earlier, <laughs> right? This should, but that's a real time experience, right? Mm -hmm. And we are not really, we haven't been good at driving that real time data to the consumer. Yeah. And the only way to do that is to not have the contact center in a silo. Right. So for those other departments to be able to drive the data, but also for those other departments to be able to be accessed by the contact center, mm -hmm. to communicate with them yeah. with tools like WebEx Teams, with the tools, even you know simple tools like being able to message mm -hmm. to somebody in a different part of the department. The other part of it is how do we get that information to the people who need to know? Right. So I, I, my best example is I had a friend who uh, worked for one of the television uh, shopping channels, right? And she was in marketing. She was the VP of marketing for one of these firms. And she had a, a, a wall board in her office of what was happening in the contact center. Because what was happening on TV right. and what was selling and what wasn't selling, yeah. right? was vital to her. So how many calls were in queue and how many agents were uh, you know, available was very important. And we haven't really done a great job of integrating those things. Yeah, I remember a story uh, back when, way, not way back when, but back somewhat when, uh, we had a customer who at, at the executives would uh, come down and put a headset on and be in the contact center for a day. It wasn't a photo op. And I always said, if you want a CEO to know what's going on in his or her organization right away, you don't have to push a button. Go down and put a headset on mm -hmm. and listen to your customers, and you will get that sentiment of the customers right away. So we're talking about data then being very important, right? So, And I think you have some thoughts about how, how that data needs to flow. So, you know, if you think back five years ago, big data was a big topic, right? Three years ago, Internet of Things was a big topic. But I think as we sit here in 2020, what we're finding out is that artificial intelligence and actually doing something with that data is what's most important. Being able to monitor a refrigerator is sort of trivial. Being able to gather that data and understand what journey the customer is on in terms of trying to change that darn filter that's in the refrigerator they just bought, that's useful information, yeah. right? So it's no longer even about being able, to, I, th I think, to collaborate with other people in the rest of the business, but it's about having that flow of data mm -hmm. that's coming in from the devices, the departments. You know, so easy for you know somebody who's sitting in the contact center. If I know that bills went out today, and somebody's calling in today, right. and we know that there was like a big jump in their bill, 
just putting that data together and delivering it to an agent. There's an expectation, there's a way to deliver service that is going to be better for both sides. Yeah, when we acquired CloudCherry, uh, they talked about 17 listening posts, and I'm familiar with voice, email, chat, web, the kind of synchronous communication channels, and all of a sudden I realized there's a whole other world out there. Kiosks and things, right, Omar? Yep. Yeah, that, that people are touching, and um, you know, I was uh, in some airports in Europe, and they have some they have some sentiment meters there with happy faces, yellow, mm -hmm. red faces. I'm touching those, so very interesting. Well, Omar, we've got a great story associated with this with a customer of ours, and uh, share with us what we learned here with T-Mobile. Yeah. So the first thing, just talking about the fractured experience for the consumer, you'll hear corporations talk about having a 360 degree view of customers. Actually, they're confused. They may have 18 versions of Zach because mm -hmm. they don't realize that Zach's email is the yeah. same anonymous interaction on the web, is the same uh, mobile interaction on a mobile ID. So because they have 18 different identities, they actually have an 18 degree view of who you are, <laughs> not a 360 degree Not the degree. Kevin Bacon version. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you know, 20 different identities split up. So the so first thing you have to do is solve that. Mm -hmm. You know, get the data uh, about Zach yeah. to the person talking to Zach. Mm -hmm. so that's number one. But the second aspect of the fractured experience is that no agent who comes in knows everything that's known by that company about how to serve Zach. Mm -hmm. And so this is where collaboration comes in. It allows you to get the collective wisdom of the people in the company. <clears throat> and this is something we've been talking about for many, many years, mm -hmm. but what changed now is that agents are of an age where it's in the fabric of how they do work. Mm -hmm. They're texting, they're WhatsApp, they're Instagramming, they're, they're talking to their friends. Maybe we'll talk about Gen Z a little later. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened with this company, it's a beautiful case study uh, from uh, T-Mobile. It was in the Harvard B Business Review because mm -hmm. I know everybody out there is privately, secretly just reading uh, Harvard Business Review every night when they're alone. <laughs> yeah. But it's a wonderful uh, case study. And it, they thought the experience completely in a new way mm -hmm. where they said, we're going to take groups of you know, roughly 140,000 consumers, put them in a pod. And in that pod, it's gonna be a matrix group where an agent isn't serving the customer alone. They've got technology specialists, they've got customer resolution experts, coaches, team leaders, all in the background using, using collaboration tools to help solve in real time right. something coming through to a consumer. Yeah. And what they did, you know, first of all, typical execs would hear a story like this and say, oh my God, that's expensive, we're not doing that. Right. But what they did, changed their NPS. They went from the NPS of a carrier. Right. As a matter of fact, J.D. Power just gave them a, a very big award yeah. yesterday yeah. because of their, their just world-renowned service and their accomplishments here. They went from having the NPS of a carrier to equaling Nordstrom. Mm. Now, this is just an amazing Which story. Which is also a Seattle-based company, I believe. That's it? right. Yeah, wow. Now, the other mm. th aspect of what that did is they cut their agent attrition in half because if the agent's part of a team, they're feeling like they can actually influence the P&L. Right. Like they can really move the needle on a consumer experience. They're like, they stay there longer. They have ownership. Right. And if an agent stays there longer, the retained knowledge, of course, is now brought to bear. Mm. Uh, it reduced their transfer of calls. It changed their churn. Their consumer base went up. Right. This is a wonderful case. I actually saw it with my own eyes. You know, I, the, the, their, their contact centers are really well thought out. So at the end of the day, what this is, is getting the power of collaboration so that you don't leave the burden of a customer interaction on a single agent, it gets pooled. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Cisco, we have a whole collaboration group. We're part of that. Right. And we were able to bring the capabilities of WebEx meetings so you can do video escalations, WebEx calling, WebEx teams, mm -hmm. so you can get the full team engaged and it's embedded in the single platform that we have that's part of the contact center. And often when people say, why is the contact center at Cisco part of collaboration? It's because we don't want to rebuild those capabilities. Right. These are some of the most used collaboration capabilities. 300 million people at work right. use Cisco collaboration capabilities. Right. So we didn't rebuild it. We leveraged it. Yeah. Well, to, you, all, you remind me of uh, when you talk about T-Mobile, something I really like, and it's a point you make that they optimized around experience and not time. Contact centers have all been about time and motion study, the Hawthorne Works, Western Electric, ASA, average speed of answer, declare success. 
And we used to say average speed of answer is not market, market or wallet share. And they just said, we're, we're going to leave those in the background and we're going to, in the foreground, is going to be customer success. And that's a good point. And another term I like to use is they make the rest of us like the best of us, right? They're, they're, they're raising the level of the boat so yes. that, that and we'll talk about uh, what we refer to as super agents a little later. And last and finally, and this could be a whole section, uh, mm -hmm. is on AI or artificial intelligence. And, you know, AI has gone through a whole cycle where it was going to solve everything, right? I remember I called CTI the role aids of the 90s. It was going to fix everything. <laughs> um, and AI has gone through that cycle. However, practical applications of AI are starting to pop up. And uh, what we're going to start seeing with AI is that some of it we will know about. Some of it we will never know, but it's in the background helping. And Sheila, you have this really wonderful quote from uh, the founder, I think, of IBM Correct. about that. And he said... So one of the things that it picks up on this particular quote is that AI has been around since the 50s. This yeah. is not new. Yeah. Uh, what's new is some of the, the technologies and the computing power and the algorithms and the amount of data yes. that the cloud supports. Yeah. But I mean, I like to always bring it back to this quote that says that the machines should be nothing more than tools right. for extending the power of human beings. And so when we in the contact center speak and think about AI, we don't think about it as chatbots and replacing agents. Yeah. We're thinking about it as how can we help those agents be even better? And to the points that we were making earlier, by the time you get to a live agent, you've tried other things, you expect that agent to be a super agent. Yeah, yeah. You expect them to be all knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. You know what information is available about you. Yeah. I, you know, The telephone company should know that I've been a customer for 12 years in New Hampshire. I've just moved. You, you know, I, by the way, I want that recording to be saying I moved for three months. I yeah. don't want you to just have my, my people high and dry who are right. trying to call me. Um, but I, you should know that. I shouldn't have to tell you. You have those records. You yeah. changed my billing address. Yeah. You should know, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not just the agents, and that's one of the things that we've been talking about in right. terms of collaboration, yeah. right? The employees as well who have to support the agents and perhaps sometimes answer those questions uh, for, for the consumers. Yeah. So what we have is AI is very, can be very specific in the contact center. It can support agents. It can enrich the interactions. How? By analyzing the data that we already have, analyzing things that are happening in real time right. during interactions, and provide that, serve that up, to the agents so that they can use that information in real time mm -hmm. and personalize yeah. the interaction with the customer. Yeah, it's interesting. Every every technology that's made a difference in contact center hits multiple constituencies, right? There's a thread when you do something right in the world of contact center and we're you know heading into the next group, right? The supervisors. How does AI help them? Right. So the supervisors are such an important part of, of what's going on. And when you think about the tools, for example, of Cloud Cherry. You know, surfacing them to supervisors, to, for them to see the trends that are happening so that they can change things. Agents are not expected to change operations and change processes. Mm -hmm. But if we can feed supervisors better information yeah. and also help them to better train agents and to spot issues, to target things better, um, that's what AI is going to do in the contact center. Yeah. Very specific ways of helping Supervisors and agents do yeah. what they do every day. And then the third constituent, always, is the people who care about what the business outcomes, right? If contact centers are anything, they produce outcomes, some, some one way or the other. And for years, they've kind of suffered under uh, being associated with, with frustration and that. But they're, they're, the tide is turning here. And so how would it help a business outcome? What do you, how do you see AI doing that? So, you know, the point of this slide for me was mm -hmm. we're not going to do AI for AI's sake. Right. A CEO is not going to say, ooh, I want to do AI today. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, they're going to do it because of some business outcome that they believe right. or some business outcome that they know they need in their business. They need to reduce complaints. Mm -hmm. And perhaps T-Mobile had that before they went to the pod system. Right? We have too many complaints. This is a way to help solve that. Mm -hmm. We want more online activity. Right? And how do we get that? Mm. How do we improve customers' access to things? Yeah. And then we want faster order processing. And maybe that happens because of collaboration, yeah. right? Giving the agents both the information and the access to the people 
so that we get shorter time to money. Yeah. So it's very specific. Yeah, exactly. And of course, there's this whole dynamic of, of the whole generational flow. I mean, we are seeing a you know, gigantic wealth transfer from millennials to Z's and the like, and they're, they're getting the spend. And I know you've spent a lot of time in this area. Tell us some of the things we should know about this in, in terms of AI and the generational elements and aspects of context. So there. real quickly, I think whenever I hear an executive talk about blah, 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 about the millennials, I always say, well, what about that next generation? Because millennials is actually an old story. Mm -hmm. The oldest millennials are now 40 years old and having their children, but the youngest Gen Zs and the oldest Gen Zs are coming into the workforce. Yeah. And how are we preparing for them? And how are we recognizing that they are indeed different than millennials because they are? Yeah. Um, and so one of the attributes, and there are seven that have been coined by uh, um, a pair of authors, Jonah and David Stillman, mm -hmm. who wrote a book, Gen Z at Work. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about them is that they're do-it-yourselfers. They, the Gen Z grew up in the age of the internet and yep. YouTube, and so they want to self-serve. And they're concerned, how do we delight them? By offering them the digital alternatives yep. that they need and want. Yep. And to, to tie that right back to where we started, it's so difficult to do that with premises-based systems yeah. that don't have some of those attributes of the cloud. And I think another thing is that uh, they are they are about now. I, I want patience and I want it now. And to provide some of that uh, that terrific service that the gen any generation right would expect, but particularly those from the Z, we, we're surrounding our contact center agents, that uh, our Cisco contact center agents, with a bunch of AI assistants. And Omar, this is a sweet spot. Here's here's a fastball coming right down the middle, <laughs> about 88 miles an hour for you. And you know, this is your area. So tell awesome. us a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah. of course, I've been spent several years just building AI capabilities uh, within uh, Enterprise Assistant. This is really interesting. You've got about 18 million uh, agents out around the world, and there's two ways you can uh, approach them with AI. You can automate them away, and so those jobs disappear, or you can empower them. You can make them super agents. You can make them better at what they do, extend the range of things that they could answer, uh, reduce the time it takes them to get to that answer, increase the quality and depth of their answer, and that's the approach I'm really focused on here. So if you think about it, the profile of the work is going to change. First of all, you will have some conversational IVR come into play, so a, a consumer can come through an interaction, either a chat or voice interaction, and they can have a simple problem solved automatically, self-serve, they're not holding on, on the call, they're not going through complicated phone trees, they're getting an answer quickly without speaking to an agent. That's great, so what does that leave? It means the profile of the call or the chat that comes through to a live human is gonna be more complex because mm -hmm. we filtered out the simple stuff. Right. And in those situations, they really want to speak to a human because right. they know that this is not going to be some, some simple one-sentence answer. At that point, what you want to do is bring to bear the collective wisdom that that company knows about interacting. So for example, I was about to get on a plane, I'm going into Barcelona, and I don't know if my uh, data plan works for Barcelona. So I'm going to call in. Typically, an agent would, would of course, put me on hold 17% of the time because right. they need to look up and research the answer. Right. With AI, you don't have to do that. You can bubble up an answer immediately to that agent that tells them, yes, their data plan covers this situation, right. and you're off and happy in seconds. Right. So that's one type of, uh, type of interaction. And it's getting smarter because as you're resolving customer problems, the AI is learning. Because at the end of the day, AI is just learning from past human interactions mm -hmm. and just getting smarter and getting better. So that's one area. You have the self-service of conversational IVR, and then you have one other area, which is while the call is happening, can the AI listen to it, identify sentiments, use that for opportunities for coaching, mm -hmm. so you can prove that agent's next experience. A new agent comes in, they immediately know the best interactions, they can learn from them. So AI is really gonna accelerate all sorts of aspects of how agents interact and serve uh, consumers. Yeah, and you brought just a tremendous amount of, of passion and, uh, and focus on this area. And you know, maybe just in, quickly, just kind of summarize, what is our strategy here? What are we doing? It's, 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 uh, it, the time is ripe, I know. Yeah, so this is a, a, a two very different approaches to the problem we have all in one place. We've acquired here at Cisco 
Uh, three companies over the last two years spent over half billion dollars, have over 100 people who are core ML AI people. When I went out and recruited the team at Voicea, Google, Cisco, Microsoft, a whole bunch of people invested because we had a team that pulled some key leaders out of Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Apple, LinkedIn, uh, a whole bunch of companies that were really focused on AI. We pulled them into one company that said, we just want to apply AI into multi-speaker interactions. So it was a very focused uh, area. We made a lot of progress. And they're at Cisco building on top of the Cisco stack, aware of the type of voice interactions that happen in contact center, in meetings. So we're making a lot of headway in building very accurate solutions for those situations. Um, and we're very proud of that. However, when I came and took over, I didn't want to do that kind of arrogant, we are the only in the market solution out there. We surveyed the market, we worked with a whole bunch of people, but we ended up really going deep with Google mm -hmm. and embedding their CC AI capability into uh, what we do so that we can offer a best of breed approach. Beyond that, by the way, we are open. So mm -hmm. we will plug in other AI solutions out there, but sometimes it's, it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense to go deep with a particular partner. We selected Google Cloud to go deep. So we're offering our own proprietary solutions that give you real-time transcription, that do some intent detection, and then we're doing uh, a more extensive set of languages with Google. We go deeper with what they've done with CCAI and Dialogflow. So I can tell you the marketplace is really buzzing about this. When we go out and meet with customers, uh, they have been building very unique applications on top of this. So I I'm excited about what we're seeing here. I am too, and I'm so grateful that someone with your background and pedigree is part of our business now. It's been very exhilarating the last few months just seeing how, how far we've come. So we've reached kind of that pivot point in the presentation. We've really discussed what's going on around us, the, you know, the why. Now we're going to get into the what and how. So what we've done in the last few moments is talked about the notion of experience management becoming a top of mind. We knew that, Sheila. That, you know, predictions are hard, especially about the future, but I know that we thought this was going to happen and the day is here. The next thing is about integrated collaboration, how the, con the very nature of the contact center is changing uh, through front and back office integration, the ability to make the rest of us like the best of us through some of these teams, and of course, this just super motion around AI, uh, creating super agents uh, and bringing in both known and where AI is evident and, and lots of times where AI is not evident, where it's learning and the like. So Omar, as we, as we have uh, thought about these things very carefully, you've talked to a lot of people in the industry and our teams have been listening. We have a very strong voice of the customer program and essentially we wanted to share uh, associated uh, uh, with, with what um, we have, uh, with, with how, how we are um, thinking about uh, solving the next generation of problems. So. Yeah, so essentially I, I come from a background uh, that is uh, essentially born on the cloud and only offered uh, cloud uh, solutions. So I have a little bit of impatience on wanting to take customers all the way 100% <laughs> to the cloud immediately. Mm -hmm. But the reality is when you talk to some of these corporations, um, they have a different uh, set of situations. So you talk to someone who's like a major gov government group or a major bank, and they've got 10, 10, 20, 30, some of even 50,000 agents deployed in a situation where it has to be super high scale, super secure. And what they're coming to us and they're saying, hey, I need this to be secure. I need it to scale at a very high scale, and I can't afford to move to a cloud where I'm not sure if somebody else's volume spike is going to be impacting mine. Right. So that's part of what, uh, what they're saying in, in the mode of, hey, I want to protect the asset. I've been running this for a long time, and it's really running well, and it's secure and scalable. So, so that's one thing. On the other hand, what you do here, because none of these people wake up in the morning and say, I just need to go to cloud. Right. There's a driver for that. Yeah. The clear driver that you hear, even for the ones that are government institutions and want to control everything in terms of their ACD and their routing and so on, is I need feature velocity mm -hmm. because my competitors are moving fast. Right. People are, consumers, when they come to interact with my brand, they're interacting with the Disney Pluses and the Teslas of the world where they radically change the expectation of what the product can do. I need feature velocity, and that's where they really want the cloud. So that's what's pulling them to the cloud. What makes them a little bit hesitant is security. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have a security breach of credit card numbers or emails going out, and all of a sudden my brand takes a billion dollar hit. 
right? They can't afford to have that. So that's kind of maybe something that, that's pulling them um, uh, less slow. The next thing that they want to see is, okay, Omar, you told a great cloud story. I know you want me to move to cloud. Where's my migration? How right. is this going to be easy? Yeah. Right. How can you make it seamless? I want the same agent experience. I don't want to retrain the agents. I want all the data and the data formats to carry. I want my routing scripts all to carry through. So that's one of the things they're saying, okay, but show me that and I'll, and, and I'll jump. And then finally, really what Sheila was talking about was integration, mm -hmm. the kind of custom solution they've built in terms of plugging it into CRM. And so we don't have the 20 versions of Zach, and mm -hmm. we know that you know, anonymous Zach is, the, is you know, Zach and Gmail. That requires you to have the same form of integrations. And the last thing they ask for is, I want the Cisco backed. Why? Right. Because I trust you. Right. You're global enterprise, you're secure, you're part of the fabric of my entire workplace. Right. So I need you to stand behind every piece of this, even if it includes a partner integration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what we're hearing. Yeah, and, and we're hearing it, uh, I would say, not in the, in the far corners of the far reaches of the industry. It's a cacophony right now, basically, totally. of people who've come to us, and uh, both current customers and prospects of our, our solution set. So what have we done in that regard, Omar? What have we, we've listened, we've responded, much like uh, our integrations to uh, the new acquisitions which happened in record time, I think we have also come to market with something in record time here that's very appropriate. Yes, we uh, announced this product in Barcelona about a week ago, uh, very excited about it, WebEx Contact Center Enterprise is new. Why, why did we do this? We had WebEx Contact Center. We continue to invest very heavily in WebEx Contact Center. But most solutions for the cloud started out with kind of SMB and small groups within large enterprises in mind. Yeah. And so did we. But if you were gonna serve the large enterprise that had this complex set of integrations, wanted to control the ACD and the SMB market with the same solution, you were kind of torn on what feature to focus on. So we decided to have two offerings in the market. One is WebEx Contact Center and one, one is WebEx Contact Center Enterprise. However, you can't afford to split your engineering teams into all these different pockets. So the way we've organized it is we put a huge amount of our engineering effort into the WebEx platform for the contact center. Now that platform is a multi-tenant platform. A lot of it is actually public cloud. Mm -hmm. And in that platform, what do you get? You get the calling, you get the meetings, you get the messaging through Teams, mm -hmm. you get the AI through Voicea, mm -hmm. you get the experience management through CloudCherry, you get the data analytics and the data lake that powers us all at the platform la layer, and that's equally available in the multiple cloud product sets, mm -hmm. both WebEx Contact Center and, and Enterprise. So, and that's really where we introduce new features, we're gonna move it there, that gives you the feature velocity, mm -hmm. and so on. But WebEx Contact Center Enterprise is now this new offering that has two elements to it. Yeah. It has the multi-tenant components that I talked about, but it has Cisco owned, operated, hosted components that gives you the ability to go to 24 or even 30,000 agents mm -hmm. right away. Mm -hmm. We can provision this capability for you very fast. Mm -hmm. It's not classic kind of hosted HCS mm -hmm. where you, know, you talk to them and then they start buying and they start spinning up. Mm -hmm. This is available. We, we showed a situation where we're able to do this within the day. And so this is how we appeal to the larger enterprises, want that, that balance of the, the control of the ACD and the kind of the, the hosting for you to be able to, to spike up to massive scale and control the security, but have that feature velocity and multi-tenancy. So if you um, go on to where this is available, we're instantly now available in uh, all across the globe in data centers where this has already been deployed. We're ready for business. The engagement here is very big. Lots of large enterprises already are in these data centers. So uh, we're really excited about that. We, we made sure that we, by the time we released this, that we, uh, we already had solutions in place. And if you look at how this breaks up, it's basically the mature capabilities people have expected mm -hmm. from our you know, CCE solutions. So this is omni-channel capabilities, the uh, ACD, calling and voicemail, team collaboration, the integrated voice por portal, the uh, finesse agent desktops. That's a really interesting example here, the finesse. You don't have to retrain it. It's the same finesse set of interfaces that you got used to before, allowing all those custom integrations to CRM to just carry over. You have a single uh, pane of glass. We did create a new administrative portal for mm -hmm. this solution because it's, it's a cloud-centric uh, solution. Yeah. So there were certain differences we had to do between the administrative portal and what would you 
you would get in a uh, CCE uh, solution. But the reporting and analytics is the same, the API interfaces are the same, the data formats are the same, so it's a seamless migration. We also included some of the capabilities that are optional add-ons that typically the larger corporations would have, mm -hmm. the WFO, the AI capabilities we just spoke about, the conversational AI, the CRM connectors. It's a very robust solution, and, and that's why it's appealing to the larger enterprises. Yeah, I would say, and Sheila, you, as we talked about this earlier today, uh, you, you found this kind of an interesting uh, uh, combination of architectures, and perhaps very powerful, not to lead the witness, but what you know, it's, it's somewhat different, right? So various vendors are taking different approaches to how do we address mm -hmm. some of the issues of the large contact center that we led this session talking about, right? And some companies are saying, well, we'll do a combination of this premises-based solution and add new cloud capabilities and connect it to them, right? But then you end up with a hybrid that is hardware-based and some things in the cloud, yeah. but you end up with some of the same problems that you had with hardware-based systems. Right. This, to me, is a unique approach. It's a cloud-cloud mm -hmm. hybrid which we haven't seen in the market. So it's a single tenant cloud for the base capabilities. Mm -hmm. So to your point, you don't have to change the way you've been working, the way you've been doing things with 20, 30, thousand agents, mm -hmm. but we get that velocity from the multi-tenant cloud. Right. And I have to believe that what we're going to see over time is a migration of more of the capabilities to that multi-tenant, right? Mm -hmm. Which creates just this absolutely smooth migration for the customers. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting and, and unique approach. And if you think back to why we are at 15 to 20% penetration of 18 million agents, this kind of solves for X in many ways, right? So, mm -hmm. Omar, uh, take us through basically just you know in review of these, these trends that we have here, how the solution lines up with that. Yeah, so I mean, we've talked about experience transformation, the collaboration capabilities that allows you to tap into the collective wisdom of uh, the, the agents and the employees of the contact center. We've talked about AI super agents. Um, all of these capabilities are at the platform layer. They're multi-tenant. They give you the feature velocity that Sheila was talking about. Uh, but you also have the core foundation in being advanced routing, reporting, omni-channel capabilities. And you want to make sure that core doesn't change mm -hmm. in terms of retraining them, protecting the integrations and the data formats. So we've really you know, built a solution which has you know, pieces of that stability and core right. and deep integration with the feature velocity that Sheila was, was talking about. And you know, if I have to be honest with, with, with everybody here, um, I didn't and everybody out there. Yes. <laughs> I didn't design this, yeah. right? The, the, the corporation was thinking about this before I got here. Mm -hmm. What really changed is how we leaned into the customers are telling us something. Mm -hmm. They're telling us you've built this pure multi-tenant cloud solution from the SMB up. We want you to also give us this alternative so mm -hmm. the largest corporations, that's where Cisco mm -hmm. came in and really just listened to the customer. I'm a big believer in innovating ahead of the market, but sometimes your best innovations really are just handed to you by listening to your customers, yeah. and this is an example of that. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So, let's just kind of summarize here. I've obviously, not obviously, but for me, I've, as usual, learned a lot uh, in these sessions. Sometimes I learn as much as I pretend to share. So, a couple of things we want to just kind of hit in conclusion here. If you're an existing Cisco Contacts and Enterprise customer, we have a beautiful path for you to all the attributes and the advantages that were suggested here around hitting these three big trends. So we have a single contact center platform. We have reduced pain of adoption. One of those barriers to getting the cloud is pain of adoption. If you think about it, one of the facts we like to use is it takes four to seven to eight weeks on average to train a contact center agent. If you go from one desktop to another and you have a thousand agents, that's anywhere between four and eight thousand weeks of people time to, re to train them. If you don't have to do that because you have a seamless migration from one form of a desktop to the exact same one, which is what we do for our current customers, that is a a huge win. Uh, also, managing these solutions is going to be even more important than ever, and we've invested heavily there. So what we really are doing, and we're leaning into this notion of the low effort, right? Low effort migration to cloud with all the benefits. Uh, I don't want to say it sounds too good to be true, but it is a very different value proposition than perhaps is out there for many of our customers. And what's important is also the, pr the process uh, and integration protection. The contact center is the most threaded, as 
Sheila mentioned before, the most threaded and integrated solution in the enterprise. Those can come forward in a very, very elegant way. And so you can hit the ground running with all the benefits of cloud at the same time getting over there with least disruption path for our existing customers. And we also have some ideas for those who want to come work with us that are not our customers. So what do you do? We've had a lot of fun here today. We've learned a lot. Uh, I want to thank Omar and Sheila, as usual, for just being terrific guests. And so what do you do now? You know, you, you, you listen to this and thank you for tuning in. Now what? Well, the first thing we need to do is step back from these trends and say, what have I learned today that may be able to drive new areas of value for my business in terms of experience management, in terms of team collaboration and how AI is expressing itself and the ability to do things now that are much more relevant than perhaps just science projects. And if you're a Cisco customer, start with your Cisco partner. We have a great partner community. Start with your Cisco partner and talk about a migration plan, mapping these trends to where you want to go. And if you're new to Cisco, and by the way, over the years, we have had many companies come that are now Cisco customers that are new to us. Visit our product page below. Take a look at that URL that you see there and visit our product page and talk to us. We have a great opportunity for you to differentiate what you do vis-a-vis -vis your contact center solutions. So with that, we'd like to bid you farewell today. Thank you for investing your time with us. Uh, we've had a terrific time together and uh, we really wish you well in changing your customer experience and we trust that you want Cisco to partner with you to do that. Thanks for joining. So here we go. I want to talk about real news. So let's talk about what we're going to launch today. Here we go. All of you have made some pretty amazing things possible over the years. We got WebEx, we got TP, we can do it wherever we like.